Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Anthony Brown, just the obligatory about me section. I'm a student at the University of Southampton. I do electronics. Uh, I also release games and app things under the name Blue Geek Studios. Right, main event, F-Shop. So how many of you have written F-Shop or write F-Shop? That's good, I guess, <laughs> in one way. Um, so, right. F-Sharp is a strongly typed, statically typed, multi-paradigm, functional-first programming language which runs on the .NET framework. It's done by Microsoft, but it's entirely open source, so it's not the evil side of Microsoft, <laughs> so you're fine. Um, yeah, uh, and it's got... You know, functional languages have really got this mindset with people of it's a functional language, so you know, I can't handle this. But from having used F sharp a lot, F sharp is more like functional programming for the rest of us. You know, you might you don't need to know a, and have a PhD in maths or whatever and be this genius at maths to be able to understand it. But I'm not going to just stand here and show you slides. Demo time. So, I mean, yeah, nice bit of ASCII art to separate them, because that's slides. Um, well, first thing is, I guess functions are a pretty important part of it. Um, and really lightweight to create. So there we go. Add A, B. There we go. And it infers types on everything. Look at that. It reckons it's an integer, which I'd say is about right. We've also got lambdas. And, well, we can partially apply functions, as you'd expect. Uh, we can even define our own sort of operators. So, there you go. Forward pipe, xf equals fx. So it means we can create more readable expressions. To me, that's pretty understandable. Procedurally steps through the code, and I can you know, easily see what's going on there. We can also create you know, additional functions to compose functions. Once again, really makes you sort of bind together all these little aspects that just make your code more readable and easier to understand. Uh, and you can start to combine these things. So we're all good software developers here, so we all write tests. Uh, and if you've ever done any OO code, you've probably had tests, something like that, at the top. And it just, that title of a test just does not appeal to me at all. But f -sharp function names can be anything you like. Yeah. So there you go. Function names got spaces in. And... Things like forward pipe operator mean that my tests are actually pretty readable and I can instantly understand what's going on, that 5 plus 7 should equal 12, and I hope it does. Types. So, as I said, it's statically typed, strongly typed. And we've got plenty of types, like loads of types. You've got your basic record types, and we can get type inference on functions like that as well. It assumes that we're taking the user type and, well, it's exactly what I wanted it to use. We've also got discriminated unions, so enums on steroids. Uh, and if you've ever done any OCaml, you'll probably notice that a lot of this is similar and f -sharp can even output directly to OCaml if you want it to, or it outputs a subset of f -sharp to OCaml. Tuples are another really easy thing to make in f -sharp. If you've ever done C-sharp or any other language on the .NET framework, pretty much, tuples are horrendously bad to make and horrendously bad to consume. But f -sharp just, you know, brackets around what you want. Simple. Option types as well mean that 
pretty much got rid of no reference exceptions entirely in F sharp for me. I've not had a single crash from no reference exceptions ever, I think. Pattern match all the things. Big thing in F sharp, and you can pattern match on pretty much anything. So, tuples. Yep. Multiple parameters. Yep. We can pattern match on discriminated unions. We can pattern match on record types. We can pattern match on lists and in kind of crazy ways as well. So we can detect like four numbers or we could substitute the X for a seven. And in the case that it matches W seven Y Z, we can match on that as well. And then we've got the classic head tail approach as well. But we can start to extend pattern matching uh, through something called active patterns. So here we go, just got an even and an odd. And then when we use it in uh, pattern matching, in the event that we were to have it commented out, we'd get a nice little warning from the compiler saying, you've not got enough matches on this. So, you know, you pretty much get rid of that kind of opportunity for bugs to fall into your code uh, from doing your minor little checks. But because, you know, types are really easy to create in F -sharp, it makes it a brilliant choice for domain-driven design. So you've probably had things like uh, types or you've probably had cases where you know you have a username, but your username can only be lowercase. Now, normally you might add an attribute to it or whatever. Whereas, you know, with a shop, it's a single line to generate our type, and we can't, you know, then lead to, or we can't get problems from this. So here we go. In the event that you say allowing users to set up accounts. And, you want, and your users can only have lowercase usernames for some obscure reason. If we try and use a regular string, it'll fail. So we can start to, you know, hide away our actual domain logic or our domain logic and our means of creating, you know, our instances of that logic. So we're not sort of combining all of your models and your actual code, which is, you know, hiding all of your extra bits that you don't need. Uh, now, how many times have you been sat in mission control watching the rocket go up and it explodes in midair? No, just me. Um, and you look into why, and it turns out that somebody uh, passed kilometers to something that should have taken miles. You know, something which your tests should cover, but sometimes they don't. It would be really nice to be able to get these kind of things at compile time, wouldn't it? You know, get rid of that kind of run time, is it going to work, is it going to fail? So in F sharp, we can create things called units of measure. And it's just an attribute added to a type. So now we can create something which is, say, 10 meters. And we have a function called add 5 meters. It assumes that x is going to be of some type meter. So if we were to try and pass it a regular old integer, it's going to fail at compile time and say, Look, you should have done something different here. Yep. Sorry, what's the syntax of your measure? Uh, it's just an attribute. Yeah. So F sharp or in C sharp, usually attributes is square brackets. In F sharp, you just have to add the uh, greater than, less than, in as well. But I said it's multi paradigm, so we can get 
object-oriented constructs in there as well. And it's not very much code to do it either. So there you go. Two lines to define a basic interface. And then four lines to define a class which also implements that interface. There's no fluff of brackets or anything like that around as well. So you can really start to cut down the amount of code that we've got used. Uh, and we can also generate anonymous types which implement interfaces, which can be quite useful at times. Uh, and yeah, like I say, it's just a lot less code than what you'd write in any other language that runs on the CLR. And we can also decide to cross the streams. So you can write our constructs with functional constructs as well. You know, so we can take our record types and we can tag them with interfaces if we want to. Uh, we can take discriminated unions, tag them with interfaces. So in the event that we've got message processing systems, you know, we could have a general iMessage and there you go. We've got an error that it's a teapot 418, which is an actual HTTP status code, I might add. Um, and then we can just pattern match on types as well. Uh, so yeah, like I said, pattern match all the things. Uh, async support is also included straight out of the box. Uh, and it's just done in the form of a, a nice little monad there. Once again, really easy. Very little difference in how you'd write your async code over how you'd write your regular F sharp. Now this is the big one. So this is one of the things that I found that F sharp has got over the top of pretty much most other languages. Uh, type providers. So you might be in a situation where you've got some, some string and it turns out that string is JSON. Now you've usually got two methods of getting that data. You can either query it a bit like a dictionary and just put random strings in there and hope you've got the right strings. Or you can have a code generation step um, so it'll you know, generate all of your API level code and all your models for that API from a JSON string. But then if that changes, you've got to do the entire code generation step again. To be nice if that was automated within the language. Well, f -sharp lets us use type providers to do just this kind of thing. So here we go. I've got two strings of JSON here. And we're creating types from the JSON and loading it in. And now we get fully typed access to it. So you know, here we go. Sample one dot age value or the actual value and the name, which maps directly onto here. But we also get types on those as well. So the JSON provider is there inferred based on the context that the age property is going to be an integer. Yep. Or compile time feature or dynamic feature? Uh, compile time feature. So if I... So, so in this case, if I was to change my API here and say it returns NA instead of name, and I now hit the dot, it's automatically updated, and it now says you've got this property NA rather than name. So if I'd got you know name in there, it would give me an error and say, look, it doesn't exist, and so I can then go and check that at the compile time stage. 
And, you know, there's type providers available for pretty much everything now. Uh, you've got things like the SQL type provider. Uh, so you can jump in and, you know, access SQL databases, whether it's MySQL, SQL Server, uh, Postgres, pretty much anything. Uh, you've also got type providers for things like Excel, so you can load in an Excel spreadsheet and get typed access to everything that's on there. Uh, you've got type providers for HTML, so it'll look through your HTML, find all of your forms, and then provide strongly typed access to the data within those forms. But, you know... Did you, did you create your own type providers? I'm coming on to that right now. Okay. So, type providers, you know, it's pretty easy to make. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the language BrainFuck? Yeah? How many of you have got legacy BrainFuck applications? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, and it can be a bit of a pain to switch over from him, can't it? You know, in the case that you've got all these, you know, record processing systems written in BrainFuck, you just don't want the hassle of converting them to something easier to read, like, you know, F Sharp or Scala. So I recently made a BrainFuck type provider. You know, they're not difficult to make, and this one took about 30 minutes. Uh, so we can just, here's an example. You know, we just reference the DLL. We give it a string. It's, it's a lot of code just to do hello world, isn't it? So now, you know, we can run it in the interactive window. And, you know, we've got access to the types there. Uh, so we can then do uh, t dot console output. And there's what the program would have generated. Uh, we can also do things like uh, we can access the memory directly as to what it's generated on the pro in the program. And I've had quite a few suggestions of, you know, how to improve it further, which I'm working on at the minute. Uh, uh, but, you know, type providers don't have to be useful. I know people have been using type providers to do things like taking a YouTube video, you convert the video to ASCII art, and then you use the IntelliSense comments in Visual Studio to play the ASCII art of the video. Uh, and people have been doing other things as well. So here we go, the choose your own adventure type provider. You know, if you're familiar with the choose your own adventure books, we can do a dot intro. There we go. We get a nice little story through the IntelliSense comments. And we can go through, it tells us a story based on our uh, selections of the code as we go through Visual Studio. There are, you know, useful type providers as well. So here we go. We've got the World Bank or, you know, provides an API. Uh, and here in F Sharp, we've got strongly typed access to it. So data dot countries dot strongly typed access to all the countries that are available on that API. And we get IntelliSense. And this is, as you can see, just running in a web browser. Uh, and then, you know, you can start to plot cheery things like the maternal mortality ratio. Um, next thing, well, yeah, type providers, as you can see, incredibly useful and just save you so much time and hassle when somebody decides that they're going to suddenly change part of their API and you don't know until some user somewhere comes to you and says, this crashed here. And you spend ages looking into it and find out that somebody has changed their API. Here, 
you know, you'd compile, it would fail at compile time. Next thing, computation expressions. So the async stuff, that was a computation expression. Uh, there's also things for like sequences. So there we go. We can yield uh, strings and we get a sequence of strings. Uh, we can also add our own computation expressions into the language. You know, so we can start to do things like uh, create custom domain-specific languages within the language. So here we go. A few lines of code just to do basic logging. And now, whenever a variable is assigned and bound with the let exclamation mark, you get a nice little log message output to the console as well. But you know, we can extend these further as well. And you can start to add your own custom operators in. And these custom operators then get Visual Studio IntelliSense and also syntax highlighting as well. So here you see uh, the let and the return highlighted in blue. Any custom operators you made would also be highlighted in blue. And I pretty, I've started using these, uh, as I said at the start, you know, I tend to make games and stuff. Uh, but as a game developer, don't really have much of the artistic prowess, so to say. Uh, so you can start to like make domain-specific languages for artists, for AI and stuff. You know, so you can say, find the player, then do this, then do this. And it means you get rid of all that mess of switch statements. And you know, I showed that example to somebody at a user group, and he said, "Oh, I wish I'd have had that." You know, 20 years ago when I was making games. And he had, he had something like a 10,000K switch statement written in C. <laughs> uh, and then we've also got things like quotations, uh, which are a means of extending the compiler, pretty much. Uh, they're typically used as how you create the uh, type provider and what it returns, and you know you can start to work with the quotations here. So it's kind of like how the it's essentially access to the AST and ad adding stuff into the F sharp uh, compile stage. Right. So you've probably all been sat there thinking, yes. Yes, new stuff to play with. Uh, so if you want more and you want to go further, there's a lot of F-Shop user groups starting to spring up. I mean, unfortunately, we've got an area missing here. <laughs> but I'm sure some of you, if you were to pick it up, would very much so like to change that. Uh, it's got you know, a lot of takeoff around major financial points. So New York and London are huge. Uh, and there's fshop.org, which is the fshop software foundation, where all the resources that you could want. Try fshop.org to have fshop examples in your browser. That's where I use the World Bank one. And fshop for fun and profit .com is a brilliant sort of site for the whole idea of getting F Shop into business and its applications within business. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, you, it's only started to really, you know, have the major differences lately. Uh, F-Sharp runs on .NET Framework, so you get all of the, or it runs on the CLR, so you've got all of the .NET Framework available to you. Um, and also you start to get things like type providers and the more advanced features of F-Sharp, which aren't available in OCaml.
Uh, yes, I guess. Uh, and the F sharp, like I say, the F sharp compiler does have an option where you can say output OCaml code, and you know, or it checks for OCaml compatibility. Okay. Thank you once more.